Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming. This started out because I went to a new client and I looked at their code base and all I wanted to do was rant. This is wrong, that's wrong. And I thought the best therapy for getting the rant out of my system was to turn it on its side and say, I am not going to say what's wrong. I'm going to try and say what you should be doing and what is right. And so this talk was born as a result of that. First, I'm going to say a few words about my background, and then comes the meat in the sandwich. And the message there is good error messages are useful error messages. And finally, a little framework that I put together that puts all these ideas into practice. Although I have to say, don't have great expectations. It's actually too big to be, it's, it's not big enough to be a framework, even a little one. And it's not abstract enough to be a design pattern, but I didn't know what else to call it. Okay, first of all, me. I'm Paul Keating. I've been programming in Python, for, oh Lord. I've been programming in Python for a living for, well, since Python 1.5.2. Uh, and I've been attending EuroPython for nearly all of that time. My first EuroPython was in Charleroi in Belgium in 2003. That wasn't the first EuroPython, that was the previous year, but that was my first EuroPython. I support an application that has embedded programming languages, Python, one of the most prominent. And I write tools for programmers, applications for end users, and practically everything in, in between. And it's one thing to be angry about the bad error messages you see, but it's much more important to say what is a good error message. And this is what this, uh, this talk became. Good error messages are useful error messages. So the first question is, useful for who? And this is just another way of saying that as a writer, to get through to your reader, you have to know who your audience is. Look at what you're writing. Is it understandable to that audience? Now, if your audience is if it's an interactive application, then your audience is probably an end user. If it's a batch program, then your error message is being written to a log. So that's going to be a support person or a programmer. And if you're writing a library or an API, then your support person, you know, the person, you, your audience, is a programmer. And you have to speak to that programmer as a programmer. And pop-ups are not helpful there. And sometimes you do have two audiences. If you're writing a library module, then one audience is the programmer who is calling into your library module. And the other audience is the end users of the application that that programmer is writing. But for the present, just let's consider the fact, that, let's consider the situation where you're, you have just one, uh, one audience, because two audiences is hard. There'll be more about that later on. Consider, first of all, is your, quest, is your message understandable? Um, now, this is an over-the-top example. Um, as far as I know, it says, error, file not found in Punjabi. Um, it's an over-the-top example, but there's no getting away from the fact that if you show a stack trace to an end user, it means no more than that. If a stack trace leaks out to your end user, that's a failure. A stack trace is indispensable to a programmer. It may or may not be of value to a super user, depending on their background. It's gobbledygook to everybody else. And even if someone can read a stack trace, if they don't have access to the source code, it's still not very useful. I don't know if any of you here answer questions on Stack Overflow. No, anyone? Over and over in a comment, you have to tell you, the people who ask questions on Stack Overflow, please post your stack trace. I think I have to do that two or three or four times out of 10 for every question I, I, I try to answer. And that is because people don't actually know how to read stack traces without learning how to do it. And these are beginners, usually. They're very, very, very close to being end users. 
And if the per person who sees your stack trace doesn't understand it, then you're going to have to do some translation. Now, this came from a tutorial. A student called me over and said, I don't understand this message. It says, dict isn't callable. He said, I know a dict isn't callable. Who said anything about calling anything? And his problem was really a syntax error. He should have used square brackets instead of round ones. And he lacked the, he lacked the background to make sense of what the error message was telling him. The error message was telling him, you think you have a callable in that variable, but you don't. You have a dict. But he knew he had a dict. And it wasn't any help to him to say that he, um, that he, was, trying to, uh, uh, he was trying to call it. Now, fixing this is not a question of fixing the error message. The interpreter and the people who write the error messages in the interpreter have to assume that the programmer has at least grasped the basics of the language. And that's really what training courses are for. Oh, Lord. <laughs> but even if the interpreter can assume that the programmer has grasped the fundamentals of language, if you're writing a library, you should not assume that the programmer who is using your library is an expert. Most programmers use libraries on a casual basis. They can't be all be experts in every library module. There are dozens of, of there are dozens of things. There are dozens of libraries in the standard library, doesn't uh, in the standard library, and there are thousands on PyPI. You can't know them all. Nobody can. So, to show you what I mean, I was using Beautiful Soup, and I made a beginner error. And the library would have been entitled to issue this error message. Result set has no attribute prefix. But it didn't. What it actually said was this. This not only told me what was wrong with my code, it made a shrewd guess at the concept I had failed to grasp. That shows concern for supporting a beginner. For seasoned programmers, fixing such an error is quick. You got the error because you wrote foo.prefix. So you go to where foo was last assigned. And you see it was assigned by a call to find all. And you look up find all to see what it actually returns, and there's your problem solved. That four-step process for a seasoned programmer is so automatic, you don't even notice you're doing it. But it's hard to appreciate sometimes that for a beginner, they don't even know where to start. Now, when I was writing this, I actually went to read the code in Beautiful Soup that issued that error message. And there it is. It's a simple subclass of list. All it has is one Dunder method. The only reason this subclass exists is to give that nice error message. That was why it was put there. I think that's really great, because it shows real concern for the needs of a user who may well be a novice. The next question is, is it explicit? This code is from an end of day batch process. It writes its message to a log. That log will be read, if at all, the next morning. Now the thing about batch processes is they can't just raise an exception, toss their toys out of the, co out of the cot, and stop, because in a batch process, there is some client system downstream that is expecting the output from this program. It can't just stop in midstream. It has to deal with the error as best it can and carry on. Now, the question here is, why is anybody reading this log? Well, it's because the manager of a downstream system put in a ticket or sent an email saying, look, I was expecting 5,002 rows in my interface file, and I only got 5,000. And the person who actually reported the error can probably even tell you the numbers of the trades that he didn't get that he was expecting. So your application support person already knows that something is wrong, and he already may already even know what, what trade was giving the trouble. And then he reads an error message that says, something went wrong with trade 12345. Yeah, thanks a lot, guy. I knew that already. 
If an error message is a call to action, well, the only action this makes me want to do is put my fist through the screen. Now, oh, sorry about this. In this situation, traceback is your friend. Traceback allows you to put all of the information that would have been in the exception that stopped the program and then carry on. So, because this is being read by an application support person, traceback's are allowed, just write out the traceback and carry on. It's a very, very simple thing to do, and it's so easy, you only have to add two lines to your program, import traceback and print and traceback.printexe, and that's it. So, um, the thing there is that if you don't have a sufficiently explicit error message, then the person who's reading it doesn't know what to do. The next thing is, is it unambiguous? Now we have a situation where the message is going to an end user. The user's being told they're using the wrong payment type. If they don't understand why they're getting the message, they'll not want an explanation. And it's really helpful in that situation to know which validation rule they have broken. Now, in this particular case, you see an exception being raised, but that is actually being tracked by the application. The application puts a pop-up and says, you can't do that. So they don't see a stack trace. All they get is the message. The trouble with this is that there are two identical texts in the message, in the, in the program. If your programmer, he's, all he's got to go on is the text of the message. And if he searches through the source, guess what? He's going to be pointed at two different places in the code. So the rule is, don't put two identical text into error messages. Because the error message there, the text of the error message, is performing the same role as a line number would in a stack trace. At the very least, put in an extra full stop on the end, or put one and two, or A and B, or something, so that when the person who's trying to follow up this problem knows what, goes where to find out what, what it is, he knows where to look. If you point them at two different places in the code, it's likely going to double the time to resolve the issue. I'll um, talk more about this issue of, uh, later on. And the next question, I'll leave you to read this for a bit, if I can get the thing to stay on. This try except. Look at what it's doing. It calls a, a function. It traps the error. It changes the exception type, and it says the error happened in that line. And furthermore, the error message that it gives you error occurred in call to that function tells you nothing that you couldn't have learned from the stack trace. It is doing absolutely no good whatsoever. So in this situation, don't point the user at this point in the code because that's not where the problem is. The real thing to do here is that. Just call it. If you're going to raise an a, a exception anyway, well, raise the proper exception. Sub substituting your own error message here just misleads the person trying to find the problem. And the final question is, does it work? The difficulty about exception handling is that it very often doesn't get well tested. You have <laughs> it doesn't get well tested. Look at that code, and let's assume that the exception is deep in inside that first call. If that happens, then the assignment to curve name doesn't take place. And so the print call at the bottom will fail. Now, this is showing uh, variable reference before assignment, because you mentioned the variable in the print statement, but it hadn't been assigned yet. There are other possibilities. Very often, you'll see an attribute error because something wasn't initialized, or you'll get formatting errors. But all told, this is actually pretty good. It shows you what 
originally went wrong, the original exception, and it also tells you there's something wrong with your accept clause. That's terrific. The only thing that bothers me about this is that it is pointing me to two different errors at two different places in the code, and that takes, tends to make me go a bit cross-eyed. But this is in Python 3. As it happens, the code where this is taken from is actually running in Python 2. And in Python 2, there are no exception chains. And so all you get is the, ex the, all you get is the error in the exception. And the only way to find out what's really wrong is to go fix your error in your exception and then rerun it to get the real thing that went wrong in the first place. So, <sighs> sorry about this. So, you have code like there and you want to make sure that your accept clause really works. Well, one thing you can do is just force it a zero, a zero divide at the top of your try clause, and that will force the exception, and then you will know whether you have all the information in your accept clause that you want to print to the screen. I thought everybody knew this dodge, but apparently not. So that's why I'm mentioning. Now, this little framework that I'd like to introduce to you. I'm going to have to talk a fair about, about my working environment. And the challenge was to apply these principles in an easy way that could be mastered by people who are super users and not professional coders. I'm going to talk about a little about the software environment and the people who write the error messages and what sort of validation rules they are. Our application vendor defines hooks. These are points at which the application will call your code. In GUI programming, they would be called event handlers or callbacks. In your callback, you get your function, callback function gets called, and, you, and there are three things you can do. You can silently return. You say, I think this data is cool. You may save it in the database. The second thing you can do is fix the data you don't like, and then silently return, and the save will get saved in the database. And the third thing you can do is raise an exception. If you raise an exception, then the application will see the exception, trap the exception, and give the user a pop-up to say, you can't do that because of this, this, this validation error. The trick here is that if you raise an exception because there's a validation problem, you'll get the pop-up. But if there is an unexpected exception that you weren't expecting and you didn't trap for, then the user will also get a pop-up. And that's something you really, really don't want. It very often happens when you move a new validation rule live that there's a regression error in it that wasn't properly tested. And so you get a new exception in that has got nothing to do with the validation rule necessarily, but stops the save from happening. And that can bring your system to a grinding halt. And you can't do that. You're in a situation where you're validating a trade, and somebody presses the save button, and now he can't save a trade, any trade. You really want to avoid a situation like that because it's extremely embarrassing if it does. This is what the um, application does if, it's, if it gets an exception. It doesn't give a stack trace. It just takes the exception text and puts it up on the screen. And this is something I deliberately did in order to get that pop-up to put on the screen. I just named a module in a way that the validation rule didn't like. And that's what, that's what uh, the result is. But it doesn't have to be a Python module, of course. It could be anything. Now, secondly, a little bit about the people who write the error messages. They may be professional coders, but they frequently are not. They may be back office super users. They may be risk managers. They may be accountants. Why aren't programmers writing these? Well, because it works better if the people who know what they're doing write the code directly. Python permits that. That's why it was a really, really good decision to put Python in as the embedded programming language. Now, that would be fairly an obvious thing to do today. But the vendor did it in 1997. That was foresighted and also rather courageous. So we get complicated corner case validation. And the end users very often don't understand why their save is being rejected. They're often regarded as a bug. And the validation problem may be so subtle that the developers don't understand it either. So developers re responding to a bug report 
may need to get a subject expert to go to the user to explain to them what they did wrong. And that means you have to identify the rule that was broken. And maybe you have to run a blame on the code to find out who wrote the rule. And then you go to that person or his department and you say, hey, explain to me this. Actually, better than explaining to me, you just go to him and explain to him what he was doing wrong. So the requirements were it had to be simple cut and paste coding that non-programmers can use quickly and accurately. It must be possible to identify the rule where the problem took place, even if, even if there are duplicate messages. And finally, unintended exceptions mustn't bring the system to a halt. Now, super users very often do attach the same message to two different situations. Uh, they may do it accidentally, or they may even do it deliberately because they don't understand why it's a bad idea. And the solution consists of one simple class and also a way to distinguish between the exceptions that we want to propagate to a pop-up and the exceptions we want to do something else about because we don't want to bring the system to a halt. Now, this validation error class is really, really simple. Its sole purpose really is to identify the exception as a validation error and not some other error, and secondly, to identify the point at which the exception was raised. That function underlined on there, over there, all it does is pretty well the same thing as the thunder line macro and C. It tells you what line number the problem was at. And there are two backs in there because it has to go back one stage out of the function and one stage out of the exception call uh, to get back to the line where the actual exception was raised. And when you, when you do accept, raise that exception, the validation exception, that is the thing you see. If you look there, you'll see the validate text object is the name of the validation function, and the 977 is the line number with the raise statement. Then you can say to your programmer, well, go and look in this function that's on that line, and he knows exactly where to, where to find the problem, and then he will very soon know who to go and talk to to find out what the error is. What's really important here is that we raise a validation error so that the application rejects the save and suppress, we suppress all the other ones. You see, accept exception. The rules say never do that. Well, we do because if there's an unintended exception that we weren't prepared to trap, we cannot allow that to leak back up to the application level because it will stop the save. And you really don't want that to happen. Now, it gets written to a log on the screen. Not all users will see it and some of them won't report it even if they do. But super users will see it, and you'll find out about it eventually. Now, this is one case where I haven't been true to the source. I did this in the interest of getting it all onto one slide. There's about 15 lines to determine which validation function you call. When, uh, um, and that depends on what object it is you're trying to validate. So it isn't really called my validation function. Now, I mentioned earlier that it can be difficult to, have, to handle messages that have two audiences. And this little example here illustrates two things you can do. Firstly, have different channels for different levels of messages. So an end user message comes in a pop-up, but the stack trace gets written to a log. And the second thing you can do is raise different kinds of exceptions for different things. If someone's calling into your library, then it may be an error on the programmer's part. So that's one kind of exception. It may be things that you expect the application programmer to anticipate and do something about. And the third kind of exception is things that neither of you can really do anything about unless the user actually gets involved. Suppose, for example, that your library needs a resource, uh, a web page, a network connection, uh, enough disk space. If the user's lost his internet connection or has not enough disk space, there's not anything very much that your application writer can do to fix that. 
But you can make the application writer's life easier by having different classes of exceptions for the different things that can happen and the different things that can go wrong. So, to sum up, an error message is a call to action. What do you expect the reader of the message to do with it? And the first question is, is it understandable? Does he understand what is wrong? And that's why you mustn't give stack traces to end users. <coughs> Secondly, is it explicit? Does he know enough about what was wrong to actually go and do something about it? Something went wrong with trade one, two, three, four, five. Doesn't tell you enough to fix it. Third thing is, is it unambiguous? Does he know exactly where to look? And the fourth thing is, does it point in the right direction? Do not tell the person who's trying to solve the problem that it was an attribute over here, attribute error over here, when actually it was a key error down there. Now, while I've been saying this, I'm sure a lot of you have been saying to yourselves, yeah, I knew that. Or, OK, but that's just common sense. And pretty well all of what I've been saying in here has been just common sense. But I didn't make up these examples to put them on slides and then throw stones at them. These examples are real messages taken from production systems that were written by professional coders. So although what I've been saying is mostly common sense, well, I won't be the first person to remark that common sense isn't nearly as common as one might like. But the good side of that is that the answer actually is simple. There's good news. Writing error messages is common sense. It equates just to thinking about your user's needs. Think about the people who are reading your messages and what you expect to, them to do with them. And if you do that and you do it well, then you really, really can't go all that far wrong. Now, um, I've, I'm afraid my pacing here has been a little bit um, put out by the fact that I've been, had the projector go off on me a lot. So a lot of the uh, sort of intervening, intervening chit-chat between the slides, I'm afraid, was lost in, the, lost in the frantic clicking. And so I've come to this rather, to the end of this rather earlier than I had planned or rehearsed. So at this point, um, I think I can call for questions because um, I've run out of things to say. Thank you so much. Raise hands for questions. Uh, can I go back to one of your throwaway comments? Yeah. That uh, 10 equals divide by zero that you thought everyone knew, yeah. but I don't know. Yeah. Can you go back to that? Oh, of course. <laughs> because surely it raises an exception. Yes, that's the whole therefore, point. Yeah, but therefore you crash at that point. Yes, but you will, if you get a zero divide exception, then that's fine. But if you get another exception because what you're printing in your accept clause fails, that's what, that's what it's meant to test. Um, uh, I may not understand like exception this. handling properly here. So no, that. the thing is that that is a bad uh, that that print statement is a bad print statement because it can actually it can actually itself throw an exception. If curve name isn't defined at the point where you do the print you're going to get an exception in the accept clause. OK, yes. But you don't want an exception in the accept clause. You don't want, your, you don't want your, your stack trace to be muddled up with two exceptions, one that was the real problem, source of the problem, and one that was the, well, the exception in the accept clause. The accept clause must actually print out the problem without failing. OK. OK, so the idea of putting the divide in there is you force an exception, and then you can, that will allow you to see, did, I, did my accept clause tell me I had a zero divide? Or did my accept clause tell me I had uh, an, uh, an undefined variable in my print state? OK, so it, it's giving you something in the log file to find, just to give you an index. It, it's temporary. Yeah. It's only okay. there to test the accept clause, to make okay. sure that you haven't, your coverage is good. Right, OK. OK. Thank you. Any more questions? Raise hands. OK, everything seems clear. OK, one more. Thanks very much. Uh, just a quick question: Like, do you have a vague idea of like the longest message you should ever give? 
because I've seen some huge ones very descriptive, but... Oh. Um, well, explicit is better than implicit. Um, I can tell you that in, in this particular environment, if your error message is more than 512 characters, instead of getting a pop-up, you get a scrollable window. Um, I've never got that far. <laughs> Um, but uh, if you know you're going to get a pop-up, uh, you don't want the pop-up, the message to extend off the edge of the screen and so on. So that really more de de depends more on the situation. I think, though, that if it's really complicated, what we do here is we put line numbers in and that will, pr that will go to a subject expert who will explain the maybe then uh, a URL or something that will give a, a give a help message would be an appropriate uh, way of keeping the message within reasonable bounds. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. It appears it all was just common sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, like, thank you for the applause, but I think we still had one more question somewhere. Was it here? Yeah. Sure. All right, uh, thanks. Um, in the case uh, you mentioned of the dict uh, example, would you propose to uh, change this error message saying uh, you try to call a dictionary, but maybe you should use the square brackets? Uh, no, I don't think we should change the error message. And the reason why is because you have to um, you, you have to take account of the fact that the real error from the point of view of the, uh, of the interpreter is that you thought there was a callable in that variable and there wasn't. Now, to the beginner, he knows it's a dict and he expects the interpreter to know it's a dict. And he doesn't understand that it could in the meantime have been reassigned to something else. Very often beginners don't understand the pitfalls of dynamic languages. And the fact that he knows it's a dict doesn't mean that the compiler knows it's a dict. Um, and so the, I don't believe that it would be possible for the compiler or, or interpreter to, to actually give him uh, a message saying you've got your syntax wrong. And in actual fact, you only have to explain that to a beginner once or twice. And after that, they don't have the problem anymore. So that's what training courses are for. OK, thank you. Did all? OK. Thank you so much. Thank you.